Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. For the second half of our show, we're pleased to have Bjorn Kjost, the former fighter pilot turned CEO of Norwegian Airlines, who reluctantly took charge of a bankrupt regional carrier and turned it into an international powerhouse. Fighting to bring cut-rate transatlantic flights to a city near you, he's found himself smack up against protectionist interests in the U.S. Congress. Bjorn, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Bjorn, you're descended from Vikings, you're a former paratrooper and jet fighter pilot, and you're a lawyer. Does this terrify your competitors? <laughs> no, I don't hope so. You need competitors, that's the best of uh, actually being in this game. It's a lot of uh, very good competitors. But surely you must bring your character and experiences in, in those roles of conflict to the game. Oh, uh, well... Because um, uh, being a fight pilot, the thing you should look out for, stay out of the risk zones. Um, that, uh, that might be a good lesson to learn when you are in this business. Well, you've been profiled as Scandinavia's answer to Richard Branson. I would think you'd be complimented by that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, way overstated. Give us a little background. Most, most Americans are not familiar with Norwegian Airlines. Give us a little history. Well, I, uh, I came into this by accident, actually. There was a couple of friends of mine that I've been flying uh, together with in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And they called me one day and said that, uh, hey, Bjorn, we are in trouble. And they were uh, pilots in a small airline. And uh, I looked at that airline and it went best. And that was probably the correct uh, mm -hmm. decision for the last uh, couple of years. Then I told my friends that why don't you set up your own airline because uh, they were flying on tiny routes in the western coast and, uh, uh, and uh, obviously they wanted to do that. Uh, they needed a, a lawyer that didn't have to pay so <laughs> <laughs> I negotiated with bags to keep the airplanes. Uh, it was four or five airplanes and I negotiated with the, the, the major airline to, to have a contract. Mm -hmm. and then I, this, uh, the uh, employees should subscribe for shares mm -hmm. and uh, it was only 30 percent they subscribed for so uh, then i started to call around uh, to my friends and say hey you want to buy uh, shares in the kickstarter the airline <laughs> just out of bankruptcy and it wasn't that many that wanted it and then it was 55 percent left uh, and i subscribed for it uh, in order to get it airborne so that, <laughs> so that was the start of it so you really came in through the back door through a barter deal as a lawyer isn't that isn't that funny yeah, I, I had no intention to buy shares in in, uh, in that company but <laughs> i spent so much time and and then we were profitable actually for uh, yeah, 10 years because i learned the pilots that uh, the yeah the income had, uh, had to be larger than the expenses and that was uh, new to uh, <laughs> that's an important feature isn't it <laughs> well it was but in 2001, FAS purchased uh, this, uh, you know, this company that we had the contracts with. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they did was to terminate our contract. And there we were with uh, 130 employees, uh, no contracts. This was six months uh, after the wow. uh, say, 11th of September. And uh, there was a single job to get. And uh, how should we take care of our employees? Mm -hmm. We couldn't uh, fight FAS on these tiny routes on the western coast. So... What we actually did, we, we closed down uh, the business that we had been running and, and started all over again on this, uh, what you see in each is today. Wow. And, uh, uh, and I was a lawyer at that time, and we didn't have the management set up in order to tackle this new situation. So uh, as a, I was a chairman at that time, I, and I uh, told the board that, okay, I can take the CEO role for uh, six months, but not <laughs> more than six months. <laughs> <laughs> We started with four airplanes, so we lost a hell of a lot of money. And after six months, it was even worse. Oh boy! So, so uh, and then I uh, said, "Okay, I go on for another six months." And then it was another six months, and here I am. When Norwegian Airlines was first set up, what routes were you flying? Originally, you were flying uh, some small uh, routes on the western coast of Norway. But when we started with the 77 uh, operation head-to-head -head against FAS, we started on the major domestic routes. Mm -hmm. And our intention was actually to 
run a company with uh, four or five aircraft uh, <laughs> uh, just to give the people uh, jobs. But uh, they tried to t- they tried to take us out of the market from day one. So that's why you have to grow in order to get down the cost. Well, grow you did. You started from four or five aircraft, and I understand in 2012 you placed the biggest airline order in European history, $20 billion for more than 200 jets from Boeing and Airbus. That's quite a gamble. Well, um, not actually, as I say, stay out of the risk, so, uh, but uh, once at a time you have the possibility, and uh, we, uh, definitely we have the possibility to, to do, a, so to say, a giant leap. And the reason for that was Boeing wanted to, to uh, launch their MAX, new MAX, uh, new mm-hmm. 77, and uh, they had uh, an order of... Uh, under the 50 aircraft here in the uh, U.S., and they had uh, an order in Asia, but they lacked an order of uh, 100 aircraft in Europe. And uh, we were one of the only that could take that order, mm. and Airbus were, were, would, uh, would like to compete for that order. So there we were in a situation where uh, where Boeing needed that order, and, and Airbus tried to take that order from uh, Boeing. So it was a very good situation to be mm, Good <laughs> to time to be a buyer. <laughs> <laughs> and these planes are famous for their fuel efficiency. Is that is that right? Oh, extremely. We have one of the newest fleets in Europe. When we fly this, uh, we have absolutely new uh, Boeing aircraft. If we swap them with the new Max order that we will uh, be the launch customer of in 2017, we will save around 150 million dollars a year just in fuel. Wow, low cost is a big part of your strategy. You pay your employees quite well, but you use fewer of them. They have to be efficient, and we have to run uh, the company uh, with uh, not too many in, in the administration. And, uh, so it has to be uh, lean and uh, a lean company. Yes, we outsource a lot, so of course, uh, uh, all our uh, back offices things is outsourced. So we, we try to run uh, a very uh, lean company uh, with a fairly large scale in order to get low enough cost to pro- provide the affordable tickets for everybody. But you're also a very global company. You're chartered in Ireland. You hire pilots from Thailand. It, it really is a company of the world. Well, actually, we, we hire pilots in Europe but because they have to have European uh, certificates. Of course. But they are stationed uh, in, in uh, Bangkok for the Far East uh, operation. And uh, then we have uh, uh, a crew base in uh, New York and Fort Lauderdale in, in Miami. And and what routes do you fly today? What is your what does your route map look like? We fly uh, 430 routes to every corner in Europe. Um, uh, we fly to Bangkok and uh, and we fly to to San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, Miami, uh, New York, and Orlando. And you're trying to expand uh, here in the United States. You're promising some amazingly low fares to the U.S. What cities would you like to serve? We like to uh, serve uh, the the large uh, large cities where where actually they uh, can foresee a large growth in the tourist industry. Mm-hmm. Because I think that everybody in China, I have a cousin in in the US, and uh, people from India have at least ten cousins in in the UK. So we try <laughs> That's to, right. I want to, to come connect. visit. <laughs> yeah, we try to. Connect the people around the globe. Well, you made one funny quote I have to put on the air about how things are changing in the world. You said about Europe, we've exported all our industry to the Far East. At least we have a very good museum to show them. They should come here and spend their money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I really mean it. <laughs> the good thing about it, it's uh, actually gives, gives a rise to, in the economy to the uh, people in the Far East. So, so uh, the income will, uh, will be more even distributed. So, uh, so it's a very good thing. You run into some trouble here in the United States. Quite recently, the House of Representatives have, have passed a bill trying to prevent you from getting uh, the licenses you need to operate. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's uh, somewhat peculiar because they allege that we underpay our staff. So obviously, we don't do that. We uh, we need the experienced pilots and probably have the most experienced long haul pilots in the world mm-hmm. in in the cockpit. And, and uh, for the cabinet attendants, uh, obviously, among them, some of them have to be experienced. So, so they will typically come from uh, other legacy carriers that they wouldn't do that with uh, without uh, having this uh, better actually uh, salary and benefits in the region than, uh, than they had uh, where they left. So it's it's a ridiculous statement. And today we fly uh, on our Norwegian uh, 
a license in the U.S. And we can do that because of the open sky. Mm-hmm. We can do it from every corner in Europe. The problem is when we when we start to fly to the Far East, as Norway is not a member of EU, we have a license within the EU states. We can fly as much as we want between, for instance, China and Oslo, but Oslo is only 700,000 people living. So mm. you can't have a large... <laughs> A large uh, network in and out of China or with Oslo. That means that we have to fly to different cities in Europe, and uh, that we can only do with a European uh, uh, license. So, and uh, it's a uh, pure logistics. We we, uh, we should run one airline flying east and one airline running west. They should do uh, should be able to do the same thing. But well, who is opposing your growth in the U.S. market? It's uh, it's uh, the legacy airlines, and they push uh, the, the unions ahead of them, but uh, they, they don't like competition. That's, mm. that's uh, the only thing uh, why they do it. And uh, the reason for that, 87% of all the flights over, uh, over the Atlantic is controlled by three airlines, so they can more or less dictate the price uh, pricing uh, settings over the Atlantic. And that's why they don't like us, because when we... Uh, have opening fares of $99, and we give uh, people uh, affordable fares uh, less than $500 for a round trip to Europe. That's, uh, that's, they don't like that. That's pretty cheap. And yet the Airline Pilots Association and the Legacy Airlines managed to get 33 House Republicans to try to block you coming to the country. Are you not spending enough money renting politicians? Uh, I, yeah, you know, I come, we come from Norway, and we're not used to <laughs> You're not used to that. <laughs> spending money on politicians, we spend money on the passengers. But it is uh, it's really a quite ironic because by uh, taking in a lot of passengers from uh, different uh, from different places in Europe and in uh, in the Far East and in the U.S., we create a lot of jobs. Not only uh, up in the air, but uh, mainly in restaurants and hotels. And that's what the U.S. have been asking for. So it's uh, somewhat ironic that they try to stop for the block us. Well, you'd think there'd be hundreds of thousands of jobs created in Europe, in the U.S., if you can really bring international airfare down under $500. You've noted that that should far outweigh the race to the bottom that the few thousand airline uh, employees are complaining about. You're quoted as saying, if I was a politician, I wouldn't give up <clears throat> about the airline side what is it going to take to get them to see the consumer side? I, I, uh, they should uh, really wake up and understand what the uh, consumer wants because the consumer they, uh, the consumer wants to be able to fly on affordable prices. But uh, think about all the jobs you create uh, among the jobless people mm-hmm. because you create the jobs in the hotels and restaurants and, and that's actually where you can, uh, yeah, where you uh, like to create jobs you, uh, because there is why should you create jobs for the pilots? You do it, of course, whether it is in a, in a Norwegian airline or in a U.S. airline, it's, it's the same. We right. have to pay the same thing. So you should go for the creating the jobs uh, on the ground, not up in the air. Uh, I have not had the pleasure of flying Norwegian airlines. I've been reading about the company culture. I understand you charge for coffee. It reminds me of the first time I went to visit Dell Computer back in the early 90s. It was a senior executive meeting with their top uh, managers, and we had to put a quarter in the machine to pay for the cup of coffee. And I sent Michael Dell an email saying, why did you make me pay for a cup of coffee? And he goes, think about that. You know, our whole approach is lowest cost. Is that your approach? Uh, that's quite right. It has to be in, in, in your culture, in your backbone, that uh, you should actually be uh, cautious about spending the money uh, within the company. You should spend it on, on the passengers. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's giving, uh, being able to fly on both airs. So that should be the culture. Tell us a little about Norwegian Air's growth. What do the numbers look like? Well, we have uh, a huge cost, of course, because uh, of this uh, order. But uh, the, the main thing is uh, if you're able to fly on low cost, yes, you will have uh, high growth. And uh, the high growth uh, or the, the larger you are, the scalability in the airline mm-hmm. industry. So uh, with large scale, you, can, uh, you need large scale in order to fly on low cost. And what's your long-term ambition for the company? Uh, the the ambition for the company is actually just to serve uh, all parts of the world. And, and uh, what we see is that uh, why should it cost three times as much flying over the Atlantic as, uh, as it uh, costs to fly over uh, from east to west uh, in the uh, in U.S.? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. So 
the legacy carries uh, are more or less robbing or uh, robbing <laughs> the, the passengers. They should give them affordable fares and, and open up for competition, as much competition. That's what uh, created the uh, the industry actually through Southwest and JetBlue in, in mm-hmm. US. Mm-hmm. By giving people low fares, that should also be in, uh, so it should be in uh, on the long haul. Have you considered any strategic alliances with companies like JetBlue or others? No, we we haven't considered that. Uh, my view is that the passengers uh, should uh, fly with uh, whoever they want to fly with. Uh, so we fly them to uh, Los Angeles, and if they want to fly further on in Southwest or JetBlue or any other airlines, yes, they should uh, do that. What's your strategy for overcoming opposition from Washington? The, uh, our strategy is simple. Uh, yeah, give consumers what they want. Uh, <laughs> give them uh, low fare tickets and uh, create jobs. That's, that's uh, as, as, you know, our simple philosophy. So here's the challenge. The consumers that you hope to serve don't exist yet as a political lobbying force because you don't have a large number of customers here in the United States. And yet the legacy airlines and the pilot unions write tremendous checks to politicians. How do you address the balance? Well, that is actually a problem because I want to spend that money on the consumers, but sooner or later, the politicians shouldn't be paid off. They should wake up and, and uh, try to, to help the consumers, uh, not uh, any overpaid pilots. <laughs> are you, so are you going to try to shame the politicians into behaving? Yes, I, I <laughs> think so. They should listen to the consumers and not uh, to the high-paid uh, pilots. So, Bjorn, when I look at the press coverage that you've gotten, it's it's quite mixed. A lot of the mainstream media have picked up the battle cry that you are uh, making all sorts of labor regulation violations around the world. How do you hope to win the press over? By, by uh, the truth. Uh, you have to explain them the truth and uh, give them the facts what we are doing. <laughs> That's a very risky strategy. <laughs> yeah, it is a very risky strategy, but the uh, truth is uh, the, uh, that's what gets you the longest way, best way. Um, stick to the truth. And uh, the simple thing is that uh, when we are in, uh, when we, our crew base is uh, located in uh, New York, we have to uh, comply with the uh, New York law. In Florida, we have to comply with the Florida law. In uh, Bangkok, we have to comply with uh, the law in Bangkok. And so on, so in Spain, in Spain, and in Norway, in Norway, we have to comply with the, all the laws uh, and regulations for, for uh, our employees. You've purchased quite a number of jets from Boeing. Can you uh, maybe recruit their help? Boeing has been very helpful, and, and uh, we have a very good uh, relationship with uh, Boeing. And uh, obviously, uh, with uh, that big order, we, uh, so we give jobs to uh, mm-hmm. thousands of Americans. So, Bjorn, you've been at this for quite a while. You've had a very colorful and exciting career. As you look ahead, what are your personal plans? My personal plan is to be able to give uh, the consumers uh, affordable fares to everybody. That's what I have, what the, actually what I lived for uh, all my career when I started in, in the airline business. Try to give affordable fares to uh, everybody and uh, treat uh, your employees uh, on the first class. So much of American Midwest culture comes from the Norwegians who moved here and created the farming communities, and they're known for their thrift. I don't, yeah, I don't know uh, about that, but uh, I like to work, and, and I love to work with uh, yeah, the people I have around me. Uh, running an airline is definitely a team job. It's not uh, anything you do by yourself. Um, I have the most wonderful team around me to run that airline. Well, be honest, it's been a delight chatting with you. Good luck in your fight. Thank you so much. That was Bjorn Kjos, CEO of Norwegian Airlines, wrapping up this week's Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Drop me a line at bill at realclearradio.org and look for us Saturdays at 10 a.m. and again at 6 here on Bloomberg Boston. See you next week.